morning church happy sunday or whatever day you're watching this uh, my name is joanna and i'm excited to be able to share something with you today and i'm so honored that you are tuning in to us to our church and what god is doing here uh, a few weeks ago i spoke a message called transformers and today i'd like to continue with that topic this message is actually called transformers part two so we all love this idea of transformation. 
whether it's a little caterpillar transforming into a butterfly or a poor young servant girl transforming into this beautiful princess in a ball gown, maybe even a rusty old car being changed and worked on and transforming into a fast, sleek car. Um, we like this idea of underdogs, uh, people who didn't have a whole lot going for them, but them you know, transforming and coming out on top, being successful and doing well, turning their lives around. Um, it, this makes sense because we are made in the image of God and God is in the business of transforming people and places and situations. Right from the very beginning of time, we see God create something wonderful out of nothing. We see God create the heavens and the earth. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if you're here today or watching this and you don't even believe in God, again, I'm so happy that you're here, but it's going to be a little hard for me to talk to you about the Bible if you can't even get past the very first verse in the Bible. It says, in the beginning, God. I challenge you to open up your heart today. Open up your mind to what God might want to do or say to you. Because if God is real, if he does exist, it changes everything. Genesis chapter 1 goes on to say, The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light and God goes on to create day and night the oceans sky vegetation and people we believe in a God who can create something out of nothing a God who can take that which is formless and empty dark and void and create something beautiful and intricate he can create order out of chaos we believe in a God who always was. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present. He is creator. And yet, what's even more wild and crazy is that he also chose to come to this earth in human flesh and live among us and ultimately die for us because he loves us that much. We're going to read a story from Mark chapter 2. And we see this God that I'm talking about walking and breathing and working amongst us. So we're going to read 12 verses, starting Mark chapter 2, verse 1. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then Jesus lowered the man on his mat. Then they lowered the man on his mat, sorry, right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. Maybe you're here today and you need your sins forgiven. Maybe you're here and you need physical healing, like this paralyzed man in our story. I'm so happy to tell you that I can't do that for you. 
but I know someone who can, and his name is Jesus. Not only was he an incredible miracle working man who lived thousands of years ago, a great preacher and teacher, he is creator God who can create something out of nothing. He can create order out of chaos. He can bring wholeness where there's brokenness. He can bring healing out of pain. I hope many of you here today believe that. And if not, I hope that God shows you who he really is today. Let's watch this short clip. This is a video from The Chosen, and it is the story that we just read come to life. Joseph Nazareth! I saw what you did to the leopard on the road this morning. My friend has been paralyzed since childhood. He has no hope but you. Please, do for him what you did for the leper. That's a rope! Put it back, man! If you are willing, Rabbi, I know you can do this. you wanted. Get out your tablet at least. Harry! Is he in danger? I don't know. No, I don't think so. He's got whom in there? Yes. Can you believe we're really here for this? Yes. Down. By whose authority do you teach? Answer me. If you are willing, Rabbi, you know you can. Hey, I'm talking to you. By whom do you teach? Certainly not the authority of any rabbi from Nazareth. Where did you study? Your faith is beautiful. Son, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God our own? Right. But I ask you, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? It's easy to say anything, no? But to show you, and so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, my son, rise. Pick up your bed and go home.
God can undoubtedly change things. In an instant, he can transform things. And not just exterior things, not just physical things, but interior things too. The parts and pieces of us that no one else sees. The parts of us that only we know about. And in this story, we see this man get physical healing, yes, which is amazing. But we also see him get something much more wonderful and more important, which is spiritual healing. And this is something that all of us need. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that everyone has sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all fall short of God's standard. Now, if a judge were to find somebody guilty of a crime, um, they would deserve punishment, right? Like there would be some sort of consequence to this crime. And if this judge decided, ah, it's all good, you don't have to pay a price, there's no consequences, you get to go free, you get a pass. As we would see even right now, you know, we would cry out for justice. We would say, what, that's not right. Like, that's not fair. And so if God is a perfect, holy, just God, there's got to be consequences for sin. There has to be something that is paid, some sort of punishment. Now, that sounds scary. I, I don't want God to judge me for my sins. But thankfully, God is also perfectly merciful and loving. And so what does God do? He looks at us humans and all the sin, all the bad things that we've done in our lives. And he says, I myself will pay the price. I will pay the consequences. I will pay the punishment for your sins so that you don't have to. And so that you can go free. Like what? It's incredible. The verse I read in Romans, it goes on to say this in verse uh, 24. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. God came to earth in the form of a man, Jesus, and he shed his blood. He sacrificed our life so that you and I could go free. All we have to do is believe, thank him, put our faith in him. But the moment we try and think, oh, I can get myself right with God. I can do enough good things or study enough or read enough or pray enough or go to church enough. As soon as we try and do that, we, we become stuck and lost in our sin again because only God himself could make us right. And he chose to do that willingly. See, in our story, the most amazing part is actually not the physical healing, though that is wonderful. And it was a huge part of what this guy needed. But the physical healing was actually, Jesus said, you know, I'm going to do this just so that you all know, so that you can all see that I do have the right to forgive people of their sins. And because Jesus genuinely cares about our whole being, you know, he wanted this man to have his life back. Uh, it's not much of a life to be carried around everywhere, be totally dependent on other people. So Jesus cares about our whole being, our, our physical bodies, our minds, our emotions, all of that. But even more important than walking on this earth again with our own two feet is being able to walk into the presence of God knowing that we don't deserve punishment, but are made right in his sight. And knowing that our sins are forgiven, both now and for eternity. That's the kind of transformation that each one of us need. And if you've never taken that step, if you've never made that choice to be made right with God, maybe you still feel like, wow, if I were to die today, if I had to face God, be in the presence of God today, you know, I've had, I have a lot of sins to own up to. There's going to be punishment. If that's how you feel, I want to pray for you today so that you can know without a shadow of doubt that when you meet Jesus face to face, he's going to say, I love you. You're forgiven both now and for eternity. And so I'm going to do that in just a few moments. But first, I'd like to just dive into this story a little bit further. 
I'd like to point out three different kinds of people in this story. People who you may identify with. And I'm talking to everybody, whether you are just tuning in to us for the first time, you've never even been to church, or, or if you've been coming to our church or a church for 40, 50, whatever years. So the first person in this story, not to reiterate myself too much, I'll go over the same thing, but it's those who know they need transformation. And in this story, obviously, it is this paralyzed man. No matter what he does, no matter how hard he tries, He's not going to be able to make his legs or his feet work again. No matter what his friends do, no matter what um, doctors probably could do back then. I don't know what all they can do now, but he knows that he needs transformation. Like he needs a miracle to take place if he is ever going to walk again, if he's ever going to have his life back again. He needs God to step in. And that's exactly what God does. Jesus looks at this man, even in his decrepit state, and says, my child, your sins are forgiven. And to every single one of us, even in our brokenness, in our shame, in our affliction, God isn't ashamed to say, my child. He isn't uh, afraid to identify with us and call us his own. Say, my child, my son, my daughter, I love you, your sins are forgiven. I'm so thankful that God loves us that much, no matter what state we're in. The second uh, person or people who you might identify with in this story are those who are contributing to transformation or causing transformation. In verse 3, it says, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. So this paralyzed man had a great need, and these friends, these men, recognized that there's a need and they had to take action. When these friends heard about Jesus, maybe they had heard stories about him. They knew that he was in town. He was somewhere local. They knew what he was doing. The miracles, you know, rumors were spreading about this guy. And they, they thought to themselves and they said to each other, we've got to get our friend Jesus. We've got to get him there. Like, we can't help him. Uh, the only way that this is going to, the situation is going to change. The only way that transformation can take place is if we get him to Jesus. And they were willing to go to extreme lengths to do that. When they finally get to the place where Jesus is, the Bible says it is too crowded. People can't even, like it's even too crowded outside the house, outside the doors. So things are not going as planned. It's not going to be as easy as they thought it was going to be. But this doesn't stop them. The Bible says that they climb up onto the roof and houses were built differently back then. It would have been a flat roof uh, made of mud and straw. And they create this hole or open up this spot in the roof to actually lower their friend down to Jesus. You know, they were probably thinking in their heads, we're going to have to pay for this. You know, we're going to have to fix this. Like, what if people think we're crazy? What if we look too desperate? I don't know. Maybe they weren't thinking that at all. And, and they make sure that no matter what the cost, no matter what price they have to pay, they're getting their friend to Jesus. I wonder, if you're a Christian today, who have you brought to Jesus lately? Who have you gone to extreme lengths for? Or when it's got too hard, too difficult, do you say, uh, I'm too afraid. I, Sorry, it's a little too crowded here. It's a little too hard now. Um, a little afraid of what people might think, or what people might say about me. I don't want to look too desperate. I don't want to look like too crazy of a Jesus freak or a Christian. I, I wonder if we even notice the paralyzed, needy people around us. Last week, uh, Tanya QC spoke and she talked about how we are all called to be evangelists. We're all called to spread this good news and tell people about Jesus and how he has transformed our lives so that that can open up the door, open up the way for other people to encounter Jesus as well. I'm sure this paralyzed man in our story is some glad his friends never gave up on him. Some glad when they showed up at the house, they said, ah, oh, it's too bad, it's too crowded, it's too hard we give up. I'm sorry. 
those are the kinds of friends that I want in my life. People who will fight for me, people who will believe in me, people who will help me and support me even when I can't give anything back or do anything for myself. <clears throat> so again, I ask, who have you introduced to Jesus lately? Who have you invited over to your house? Who have you had over for dinner? Who have you just shared your life with? Because these guys, these friends in the story are vital to this whole story. They're vital to this miracle. It wouldn't have happened without them. And I want to be a part of the miracles and the things that God is doing in this world. I don't want um, challenges and what people might think of me to scare me away or cause me to shy away from telling people about Jesus, this one, this only one who can transform our lives. The third group of people in this story is those who are actually preventing or stopping transformation, which is kind of hard to believe or understand, but maybe once I explain, it'll make a little bit more sense. But we actually see this in two different ways. We see it in the crowd of people and we see it in the Jewish religious leaders. In verse three, it says, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. That's interesting. Um, maybe I'm reading into this too much, you know, reading between the lines a little too much, but I think it's possible for us as Christians to, you know, who, who love Jesus and are curious about him and what God is doing, but it's actually possible for us to become blind to the needs around us and the people around us who really need to encounter Jesus and experience transformation. And unknowingly, not intentionally, we just get caught up in our own little world, our own little bubble. We talked a lot about bubbles lately. We get caught up in our own little church programs, just the busyness of life that we're just, we have blinders on and we're actually unaware. We don't even see or notice the people around us that need Jesus. And we can actually block the way for them rather than making a way like the friends in the story. People who are searching for answers, you know, do you ever just like drive or watch people like not in a creepy way, but just notice people on the street or at the park or wherever and just think, I wonder if they know Jesus. I wonder if they've ever experienced him. I wonder if they're searching, if they're longing for more. I don't want to just take up space in a church. I don't want to just fill another seat. I don't want to just be part of a curious crowd. I actually want my life to make a difference and something to just overflow from my life to those around me so that other people, so that this world can be transformed. I, I want to be a part of what God is doing in this world and in people's lives. The other people in this story who are actually stopping or preventing transformation are the Jewish religious leaders. Um, they were also known as scribes or Pharisees. And these individuals were very knowledgeable. They uh, were very concerned with preserving uh, the law and keeping to scripture which isn't totally bad, but they also had a lot of their own man-made practices that they were just really hard on, like making sure everybody followed all of these rules and practices that weren't even from God. And, and Jesus spoke against that many times. But generally, they were considered to be very educated and influential people. However, despite knowing Scripture so well and all of the prophecies and all of the law, they didn't know when the author of that scripture, when the author of the law actually showed up in human form and stood among them and spoke to them. They failed to recognize who Jesus was. They failed to see and believe. And in verse 5, we're just going to read some of this again. It says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, 
Why do you question this in your hearts? These religious men knew that only God could forgive sins, and they didn't believe that Jesus was God. They had learned and studied so much, they actually got to the point where they thought they knew it all. They thought they knew enough. They thought they had learned enough. They thought that they had arrived. They knew the scriptures. They knew the prophecies. They thought they knew what what, uh, the Messiah would look like, what God would look like when he showed up. They thought they knew what he would sound like, what he would do, what he would say. And Jesus was not what they thought or expected at all. They expected a military leader or ruler who would overthrow the Roman government. And Jesus shows up as a servant. And he hangs out with sinners, people who are looked down on, people who are low class, people who are even uneducated. This was not what they were expecting at all. This tells me that we have never arrived. We've never learned at all. And we must always be transforming. God wants us to be transformers. When you become a Christian, it's wonderful. It's exciting. Like I still remember the moment myself and the days and the weeks and the months that followed where I just felt goosebumps. There's just so much joy, so much peace. And don't get me wrong, there still is. But that is actually just the beginning of the journey. The Bible says that We are born again when we put our faith in Jesus. But just like little babies, we must be continually nourished, continually growing. Imagine if someone like a 12-year-old, or even let's say even younger, a six or seven-year-old, all of a sudden just stopped growing, stopped growing mentally, emotionally, stopped growing physically in appearance and height, the voice never changed, uh, stopped growing in their relationships. Like, that would get a little weird after a while. That probably would not be healthy. And yet, so often, I think as Christians, we think, uh, I've been a Christian now for six years, 12 years. I'm good. Like, I'm just going to plateau now. I've learned enough. I've, I've studied enough, I've grown enough, I've gone to church enough, I've read my Bible enough, and we just come to a halt. I don't think that that's what God wants for us. Let me put it another way. Imagine if I said to Jordan three or four years into marriage, I said, yeah, I think we have reached our peak. <laughs> and I think that the best days are behind us. Like, let's just try and just surf on like where we're at. We don't even need to talk anymore. We don't need to go on date nights anymore. We don't need to communicate anymore. Like we've come far enough. Many of you probably know that that would not turn out so well. Unfortunately, that is often what happens. But we know that in relationships, things don't just reach this point, grow to this point and then just stop and stay stagnant. It's like um, a body of water. If a body of water is stagnant, meaning there's no um, flow, there's no current, it actually starts to smell after a while. It gets an unpleasant smell. And likewise, in our relationship with God, if we stop growing, if we stop praying, if we stop becoming more like Jesus, I'm afraid that we can also just kind of start to look, sound, unpleasant to the world and people around us. We must always be transforming. That's what this message is about, transformers. Not just that one-time initial transformation, but to continually be transforming. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says this, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. This tells me that it's an ongoing process. It says, let God transform you, changing the way you think, learning to know God's will. Like this isn't just a one time, one moment thing. Colossians 3 talks about this as well. It talks about living out this new life that we have found 
in Christ. And it gives us some things to do. It says in verses 8 to 10, But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. All of these instructions are for people who've already found their new life in Christ Jesus. But it tells me that there is still an ongoing transformation process that um, I think we all can identify with. We all need some transformation in our lives still. I'd like to show you one more video clip. Uh, this is somebody who needed a great deal of transformation in their life. My name is Parti Emmanuel, and I participated in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. I murdered many Tutsi under the order of bad leadership and have spent six years in prison and four years in community service. While in prison, fellow prisoners invited me to try Alpha. I went, but struggled to engage. I realized I needed to tell the truth about what I had done and wrote a letter asking for forgiveness of the relatives of those I had murdered. Life was so hard after being released from prison. I found my wife with two children that were not mine and I faced many heartbreaking situations. I didn't know how I was going to live with the genocide survivors after what I had done, my heart was filled with agony, loneliness, and fear. Encouraged by Alpha in prison, I decided to do Alpha again. I learned that Jesus forgives and experienced love in a way I had never known before. With the help of a local pastor, I went to find Vincent, whose mother and grandmother are killed, to ask for forgiveness. I now live in a village built for genocide survivors and perpetrators. Vincent lives in the same village. We have formed a friendship and I now experience peace like I haven't experienced it before. Day-to-day -day life continues to be a challenge, but I have found forgiveness and healing for the things that I have done. Got questions about life? Try Alpha. My goal right now is not to promote Alpha, but I remember when I saw that video in the Alpha series, and I was just so impacted by it. You know, this man participated in a genocide and he killed people. This was a man who a lot of people in the world would deem evil, unredeemable, too far gone, too far from God. And yet, I'm so glad that God didn't um, see this when he looked at him or when God looked at me. And God started to transform this man's life. And it wasn't just a one-time thing. He wasn't just changed completely in a moment. Yes, he was justified, but he wasn't yet sanctified. There are some Christianese terms for you. But he says that life was even still challenging. He was still learning to you know, forgive and be forgiven, learning to love again, learning to be healed and to become more and more like Jesus. God wants to continually bring healing and change to our lives. We are not yet uh, all that God wants us to be. I know that, at least I know that for myself. I wanna end by telling you about one more individual. This man's name was John Henry Newton and he lived in the 1700s and the early 1800s. And he wrote a very popular song. When I say it, you'll know what one it is. We still sing it today. Most of us are going to know it. 
Um, but this man did a lot of horrible things in his life. And he's not someone who really should be celebrated because of the stuff that he's done. But I think there's some things that we can learn and take away from his life. He was an English sailor born in London. His mother passed away when he was just little. And he went on his first sailing trip when he was 11 years old. Just to tell you a little bit about his life so you get kind of a snapshot. He lost his first job at a merchant's office because of unsettled behavior. He owned slaves and he worked on plantations. He was eventually forced into service on a Royal Navy ship, but later he deserted the ship and deserted that crew, which um, does not go over well. He was eventually found and captured and beat to a pulp. I'm sure this sent a really loud sign to all of the other uh, people on that ship to not desert. Um, after a while, he somehow convinced the superiors to let him be transferred to another ship because he was not getting along with the people on this ship. And so he went to a slave ship that was carrying goods and supplies going to West Africa with the goal of then picking up African slaves there. Horrible things. We've all probably heard the stories um, and would take those slaves, those people, back to colonies, back to North America. And so he was on this slave ship and he didn't get along with this crew either. And they actually deserted him. They left him in West Africa. And when he was there, he ended up getting picked up by this uh, slave dealer, was yet again put into a bad situation. He was actually abused, uh, treated like a slave himself. So things just like were not going well for this guy named John at all, a lot of which he brought on himself. In 1748, so he would have been 23 years old by this point, he was rescued by a sea captain, somebody who knew his dad, and he was put on board the Greyhound Liverpool ship that was going back to England. So this was, he probably felt like this was his chance at, you know, going back to a normal, whatever he considered normal life. Uh, but when he was on this journey, the ship encountered a major storm. It was so bad that he actually feared for his life. And in those moments, he cried out to God. And miraculously, uh, this ship made it safely to shore. But when he cried out to God, he had an experience with God. When God came through for him and answered his prayer, this started a transformation work in his life. On another occasion, while working on a slave ship again, he became very ill with a violent fever and cried out to God for mercy. I don't know, if I was God, I probably wouldn't have mercy on this man, but pretty sure we're all thankful that I am not God. Uh, this was another experience where God came through for him. He had some sort of encounter with God in, in this moment. He claimed that this was a turning point in his life where God started to do some much needed transformation. In some ways, John Newton did experience instant change, instant transformation. He started reading his Bible. He avoided profanity. He stopped gambling. He stopped drinking. People noticed all of these changes right away. But the transformation, again, it wasn't just a one-time thing. It didn't stop there. And thank God it didn't. He actually continued to participate in the slave trade for quite some time. He captained many slave ships. He admitted that he was ruthless and careless towards the slaves. Later in his life, he wrote these words. I cannot consider myself to have been a believer in the full sense of the word until a considerable time later. Why? Because even he recognized that he still had some more transformation that had to take place in his life. He was not yet looking like Jesus. He didn't completely give up slave trading activities until 1754, so he would have been 29 years old. But he went on to hold Bible studies in his home. He did extensive religious studies and actually became an ordained minister. He published years later writing 
speaking out against the slave trade and the horrific conditions that slaves went through and faced on those ships. He even shared his own humiliation and embarrassment that he participated in those things. He also became an ally of William Wilberforce, leader of the campaign to abolish the African slave trade, and saw the passage of the Slave Trade Act in 1807. So John Henry Newton, these are words that he wrote later in his life. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see. I'm so glad that God loves us just as we are and meets us when we cry out to him, but I'm also glad he doesn't just leave us as we are. He wants us to be transformers, transforming ourselves, becoming more and more like Jesus, but also transforming the world around us. John Newton recognized that he was a wretch in those lyrics that he wrote. He was not a good person. He did a lot of horrible things. Um, God had to work on him, change his mind, change his heart, change his perspective. Maybe you're here today and you're watching this and you say, man, Joanna, I, I haven't killed people, I haven't enslaved people, but I am not a good person. I'm a wretch, I've done some bad things. I am, I'm definitely a sinner, I have sinned in my life. Um, maybe you relate to the paralyzed man and maybe you haven't, it's not so much that you've done all these bad things, but bad things have happened to you and you are needy. You need God to show up. You need God to show up in your life. You need healing. You need God to show up in your relationships. You need transformation. I'm so glad to tell you that the God I believe in, the God I serve, can transform your life. If you identify with either of those extreme situations, God can bring transformation to you. And I'd be honored to pray for you today. On the other hand, you may be in a totally different camp of people today. Maybe you're here and you've been a Christian for many years, for some time now. I want to remind you that God still has much more for you. He wants to see you continually be transforming. He has more for you to learn, more for you to do, more people for you to reach. He's not done with you yet. Don't get stuck where you're at. Don't plateau. Don't become religious and unappealing to the world and the people around. Let's not become unaware of the needs around us, church. I, I don't want to be that at all. I want to cause transformation, bring transformation, bring people to Jesus, not repel them or turn them away from Jesus. So let's end today with a word of prayer. And just in this moment, I encourage you to just open your heart up to God. I can pray for you, but you might want to use totally different words than what I'm saying. You might want to just turn this off and just talk to God yourself. God sees you. God knows where you're at. So let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for people who are tuning into this and they identify with this idea of transformation because they need it in their lives. I pray that right now, God, you meet them where they're at. I pray that you would show them that you love them. You haven't forgotten about them. You haven't uh, overlooked their situation, the state that they're in. God, I pray if there's sin in our lives, God, we just give that to you right now. And we thank you that you died for us because you wanted to take that sin away and you wanted to have a relationship with us, even though we don't deserve it. So God, I pray that today would be a moment, a day of transformation, and that moving on from here, you would continue to transform our lives and make us more and more like you. If there's people listening or watching this today who have been Christians for a long time, God, 
we don't want to stop transforming. We want to be used by you. We want to be like the friends in this story that we're so aware of the needs around us, the needy people, people searching for Jesus, searching for answers, searching for miracles. God, we want to be used by you to see transformation take place. Help us, even in our own just walk and relationship with you, to not become stagnant, to not become dull or boring, because you are, are not boring by any means. Help us to become more and more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for watching today. We hope you have a great Sunday.